Hello, everybody. I hope you're enjoying your lunch. Uh, we're running a little behind, so we're going to try and get back on schedule through the uh, first panel. And uh, we begin our discussions for this conference by asking, is innovation always a good thing? To help answer that question, we're joined. Um, and I'll just mention the bios very uh, briefly because the full bios are all in your program. But we have with us Jim Balsley, founder and chair of the Center for International Governance Innovation and a founding co-sponsor of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Lisa Cook, professor of economics at Michigan State University. And Robert Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Our moderator for our first panel is Richard Waters, the West Coast editor for the Financial Times where he covers technology and industry. So please join me now in welcoming Richard. Uh, well, thank you very much and um, welcome. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And uh, I'm, I'm inspired, I am inspired by the title of this event. I was inspired when I was invited uh, to come and talk because to put the human in it. And by the way, um, I take it there was a deliberate kind of double meaning here, you know, I think um, we heard in the opening presentation that, you know, human is the fallibility side of economics. We didn't actually predict what was going to happen in 2008. I prefer to see the, the inspiring side of the human that, um, you know, the purpose we're all here for is um, to discover the human impacts and effects of uh, economics and um, some of these great topics. So, um, the after all is a little disappointing. It suggests that you know, we, missed, we missed the human before, but at least we're here to talk about it now. Um, and in fact, even though since we're talking innovation, uh, even the human um, might have a little bit of a question mark by it. I mean, those of you who read Ray Kurzweil um, you know, will know that he thinks the singularity is coming, well, I think it's about 30 years away, if I got that right, you know, when, uh, when machines are uh, more intelligent than humans, and humans ad actually lose our ability to understand even where machines are taking us, uh, and we start to become interchangeable with machines. But anyway, the, maybe we can leave that aspect of human for some future conference and um, focus on our, our current understanding. So um, I won't do much of an introduction, um, just, uh, just a couple of very, very quick points. Um, so Jim Balzilli. Um, uh, you all know, um, I'm, I'm uh, particularly impressed, Jim, that you wear your, uh, your membership of the worst CEO club on CNBC as a badge of honor. So, um, you know, but that's a true innovator, a true risk taker. So, but thank you for joining us. In fact, Jim, so I, I first met Jim in about the year 2000, I think it was, uh, where the Financial Times had a conference on the mobile internet. Uh, in London, you know, there was no mobile internet, but I think everybody was still dreaming .com and surely there'd be a mobile internet next. And um, on the platform we had, I can distinctly remember um, executives from Nokia with very complex handheld organizers. And I can still remember a flowchart someone showed of the kind of what happens in the networks as all these bits move around. It was absolutely mind numbing. And then a hand went up at the back uh, and it was Jim and he said, isn't there just a simple killer app for mobile? Isn't it email? And everybody kind of scratched their heads. So, um, Jim, delighted uh, to share a stage with you again. I think it's the first time since then. Um, Lisa Cook, uh, uh, Lisa, um, in her bio, um, her expertise, apart from economic history, includes financial innovation um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, finance and, and innovation. So, I think since we all, you know, we all lived through this period where the words innovation and finance, when they get too close to each other, you know, we all live to, we all live to pay the penalties. Um, my own background, by the way, I, I uh, uh, was the first reporter, I think, at the Financial Times to write about over-the-counter derivatives back in the late 80s when we were all scratching our heads trying to work out why Actually, when we, we knew back then what was happening, you know, the headlines we read every day about where stock prices were going, we knew back then that was not what markets were, that other forces were actually determining prices. You know, and here we are, fast forward to today, and we're still shocked, well, I was a bit shocked, by books like Michael Lewis's book that's now um, on high-frequency trading, you know, that the shocking thing about that book, if you haven't read it, it's well worth reading because it really does bring 
you know, it tells the old story of financial innovation in a new way. What it brings up to date is most people in the markets don't understand. They're using these tools and they don't understand. And we thought we learned that in 2008 with credit derivatives, but it's still happening in other corners. Uh, and then um, last, Rob Johnson, um, who you've already heard from today. So one, um, one definition of innovation that you, know, you often hear is it's actually the application of ideas that worked in one area to new areas. And if so, then Rob is probably the ideal person to have here because he has a very eclectic um, background um, as a fund manager at Soros Fund Management um, in government service as an economist on the Senate Banking Committee and the, the bit I particularly like is his executive producer and Oscar winner uh, on a documentary about um, US torture in Afghanistan. Now, I have to know this, Rob. Do you have an Oscar sitting on your mantelpiece at home? Do you, have a, do you actually have the Oscar sitting on your mantelpiece at home? Do you have the your Oscar. Oscar. Do you have the Oscar sitting on your mantelpiece at home? Uh, no. He doesn't. <laughs> well, I'm I, disappointed. Uh, I, I thought I'd just shake. one of the producers. Uh... All right. I was hoping that I'd just shaken hands with an Oscar winner, but never mind, maybe next year. Anyway, on that, um, what we're going to do is um, each of our panelists are going to give a quick presentation. Um, we're then going to go into a discussion. There will be microphones around the audience. This is going to be a, a pretty broad-ranging and provocative topic, and so I'm going to open it up for questions very early because I, you know, we really want to hear what's on your minds. But uh, with that, I'm going to invite Jim to come speak. Jim. Good, good afternoon, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And Richard, thank you for that uh, intro, introduction. And uh, it, it is an honor to have so many distinguished guests uh, descend on Toronto. And it's a real pleasure, especially, to host our international friends here in Canada. So, welcome, everybody. The question we are wrestling with today: whether innovation is always good, or are there instances where the disruptions outweigh the opportunities for society? in my view, is a false dichotomy. In our global economic system today, innovation, or more precisely put, the commercialization of innovation, is a competitive necessity. It may not be a, la a matter of life or imminent death for those of us living in the advanced industrialized economies, but this precise business of commercializing innovation is what separates those who are leading the global economy and those who are lagging behind. It is something we are wrestling with here in Canada. Our federal government has taken steps to spur innovation, including doubling funding under the Industrial Research Assistance Program and injecting 400 million in venture capital funds. Last year's budget allocated 20 million over three years for a pilot program to provide small and medium-sized business credit notes to help pay for research, technology, and business development services at post-secondary institutions. These policies and resources show a commitment to innovation and commercialization by our elected leaders. But they are only one piece of the puzzle. Today, Canada's issue is not about fiscal resources. The fact is that the public resources being spent here in Canada on innovation are relatively high. The OECD reports that Canada spends more tax dollars on research and development as a percentage of its GDP than France, Norway, Japan, and UK, and what may surprise you most, the United States. Despite this significant level of public investment in innovation, our productivity, an important measure of wealth creation, continues to lag other OECD countries. Our stalled productivity has a direct correlation to the 7,000 per capita income gap between Canadians and Americans. Last year, Statistics Canada updated its data comparing Canada's productivity growth to the United States from 1960 to 2011. Until 1980, in, until 1980 productivity in both countries was relatively similar. After 1980, the story begins to change. Since then, America's productivity has almost doubled that of Canada's. The gap becomes even larger when we calculate multi-factor productivity, or what we non-economists call innovation. Canada's multi-factor productivity growth 
over that period was virtually zero while it soared in the United States. Let me offer you a view from the business front lines. Having co-founded Canada's largest technology company with my partner Mike, I'm often asked why Canada doesn't have another research in motion. The reality is that RIM is an anomaly and we won't have an another unless we fix the critical capacity in this country, how we commercialize our innovation. There are many theories as to why Canada has lagged others in commercializing innovation. Everything from the macro level, we are a small resourced economy that doesn't need to innovate and commercialize. To the micro level, our entrepreneurs lack the fire in the belly to grow globally competitive businesses. My take on both of these theories is that they are superficial and miss both the trees and the forest of how innovation really works. In my hometown of Kitchener-Waterloo, we have created a technology hub called Communitech, which currently houses over 800 startups. I meet with some of these bright minds regularly and can assure you there is as much fire in the belly and curiosity there as in Silicon Valley. Every one of these young entrepreneurs wants his or her company to scale their business globally. It's not lost in them that the most valuable companies in the world are technology companies, so there's much to be gained by succeeding personally and professionally. So the question becomes, why can't these wonderful small companies we have in Canada become multi-billion dollar global powerhouses that help close our productivity gap? This isn't about the individual entrepreneur, the small meeting enterprises, the large corporation, or their government in isolation. It is about the complete ecosystem, the optimal distribution mechanisms and feedback loops that conceive, incubate, house, and ultimately protect ideas and wealth that are generated. So when we apply resources, we need them to be focused on critical elements that lead to commercial success. Only then will we better play the manipulative and competitive field of global value-added trading. I know Mariana Mazzucato, Bill Janeway, and others will be speaking about the economic ecosystems and their public policy implications at this conference, and I'm deeply looking forward to hearing their remarks. From my vantage point, the missing element from Canada's ecosystem, what is driving the United States and, others, and other leaders in productivity, is advanced capacity and intellectual property rights, what we call IPR. You may be surprised when you open your New York Times business section to see four of the five leading stories of the day are about IPR, but you shouldn't be. At the company level, sophisticated IPR capacity is a precondition to commercially scaling innovative technologies. And scaling technologies into value-added trading is where wealth is being generated at the national level today. In each of the last 10 years, only American, Japanese, and Korean companies have been atop the list of patent filers in the United States. RIM, now called BlackBerry, is the only Canadian company in the top 100, and just one of 14 organizations to hold at least 3,400 US patents. Without that, we would not have been able to grow to the tune of $20 billion. If we or other countries lagging in the competitiveness index don't build IPR capacity, high value-added companies are lambs for slaughter in the globally competitive marketplace. They will never grow, and Canada will continue to fall behind at a nation level. During my tenure at RIM, we had over 400 open IPR files, and I personally approved checks of over $6 billion for IPR in, two th in the year 2011 alone. Since 2011, both Apple and Google, who are held up as leading innovators, have spent more on acquiring IPR than R&D. You may think this is a coincidence, but they just happen to be the two most valuable companies in the world. So when you read the news that Apple is suing Samsung or vice versa, the stakes are so high that the court ruling can have an impact on the entire survival of the company. Intellectual property rights disputes are manipulative, predatory, and vicious. So how does IPR work? Large and small predators lurk until a startup gets real traction. Trolls and big company IPR spin-offs also awake, severely hampering an emerging company's competitive viability. Because the intangible value that can be arbitraged will be arbitraged immediately. 
Now, I'm not saying intellectual property rights management is everything, but it's a core missing element. And in my view, it is directly related to why we don't have another tech giant on the horizon here in Canada and why we're lagging in national competitiveness. IPR management shapes commercialization in a fundamental way, yet this is apparent only to a trained eye or to those of us who have had to learn this on the front line of the legal system. The naive, the naive may believe that IPR is the sole domain of private companies. The reality is that the game is played at the national level. If you're skeptical, look at President Obama's August 2013 veto of the independent decision by the US International Trade Commission to ban the import of Apple products into the United States because of the infringement of Samsung patents. This was the first presidential veto of the commission in 26 years. IPR law is inherently political. If you're still not sold, look up the America Innovates, Innovates Act. In September 20, in 2012, US Congress passed a law called the Leahy Smith Act. This was a once in a generation reform of the US IPR system tailored to give American firms an advantage over their global competition. The Europeans aren't far behind. In December 2012, the European Parliament passed a law that established the European Patent Court. Canada's capacity in this regard is vastly underdeveloped. As companies compete to climb the value chain, IPR systems will invariably overtake traditional trade irritants at the bilateral level and eventually become a focal point of the WTO. The global value-added sector is a deeper, deeply intertwined system of individual entrepreneurship and the broader macroeconomic capacity at the national level. Now, I'm not suggesting the costs of innovation and commercialization are not high or that they should only be measured in economic terms. In the United States, where the greatest wealth from innovation has been concentrated, there has also been great disruption. Between 2000 and 2010, the US Department of Labor reported that 1.1 million secretaries were removed from the job market. The number of telephone operators dropped by 64%. Data importers dropped by 63%. Travel agents dropped by 46%. And bookkeepers dropped by 26%. These costs are undoubtedly high and will have major social implications. But, and this is just a small sample of the disruptions. But these are the micro costs for macroeconomic benefits when a society thrives in the global economy. I believe they are generally accepted because they are coupled with the man on the moon narrative, that all Americans, regardless of their social economic circumstance, should dream and dream big, as innovators, entrepreneurs, and as nationalistic citizens. So as my colleagues on this channel wrestle with the existential question whether to innovate or not to innovate, I would like to leave you with a provocative notion. Innovation is not a choice. Human ingenuity is at its most powerful, at its most powerful is a reflection of our dreams, and dreams make life hopeful and meaningful. Innovation is intrinsically part of human progress and is essential for national competitiveness. We must continue to evolve innovate and commercialize at the individual and national level because the powerful narratives of progress we espouse and the products of the ecosystem we create are what sustain and enrich us economically, socially, and spiritually. And these narratives need to happen both nationally and within private companies. Thank you very much. So thank you for the opportunity to address the conference uh, today. Thank you for the invitation, uh, Rob. I look forward to talking to you about my research on the innovation gap. So why don't I uh, suggest to you that I have an answer to the question of whether innovation is good. You can put your forks down. It is. It's a good thing. In what way is it good? From a macroeconomic perspective, innovation is good because 
we know from Romer 1986 that ideas can produce unbounded growth. We also know from Gorillacus' work, work in 1957 that ideas have been linked to the empirical measure of the economy. So he uh, connected patents to economic activity. We also know that innovation is good from an economic history perspective. So we have a lot of work in this field. Sokoloff and Kahn noted that the great inventors of American history were entrepreneurs and they created the market for uh, science. Mokier noted that the patent system was also something that enhanced the market for science. Thompson noted that the innovation system was a cr critical component of American industrialization. But we don't have to look to economic history to think about how important the innovation economy is to the overall economy. We get a positive contribution to the size of the labor force from the innovation economy, and here I mean science and engineering occupations. So we have five to 19 million people in the innovation economy, depending on how you uh, define it. From 1960 to 2011, the number of workers in this economy grew at an average rate of 3.3%, and it was only 1.5% for the overall workforce. There are lower unemployment rates in the innovation economy. So if we're looking at October 2010, when the labor market was still healing, and it still is, we had 4.3% unemployment among scientists and engineers, 5.1% of all college graduates in the workforce, and 9% overall. If we look at incomes as well, there's a big contribution from participating in the innovation economy. Earnings in this economy are roughly double those of other sectors of the economy. The median worker in the innovation economy earns just above $70,000, and the average worker otherwise earns roughly $35,000. So if we're talking about participation in the innovation economy, we can think about three stages or three components of innovation. Preparation and education, the actual work of invention, and the commercialization of invention or innovation. So with respect to preparation and education, women are increasingly participating in this part of the innovation process. So in 1970, they were obtaining only 9% of science and uh, engineering degrees, PhDs. But by, 19, by 2005, they were obtaining 40% of those. For African Americans, this was 1% in 1970 and 4% in 2005. So both have um, increased their presence here, though uh, to a very different degree. And we see similar trends in master's degree programs and in bachelor's degree programs through 2010. And here the data are mapped. Um, if you uh, can't see the, the little lines, the maroon line is for, this is uh, sort of by uh, decade or by uh, smaller increments. Um, and these are women by field, doctoral degrees by field. The maroon line is uh, life sciences. This is where women have the greatest presence. Uh, for example, uh, in 2010, women received about 60% of the PhDs in uh, biology, and you see the least presence in engineering, and that's fairly persistent over time since 1968. For African Americans, is also a concentration in the life sciences. Uh, that's been fairly persistent, but there's been catch up with respect to engineering. So there isn't this big gap in engineering, but there is fair uh, persistence with respect to the physical sciences. There aren't as many African Americans in the physical sciences. So if we move on to invention, uh, between 1993 and 2010, the share of workers uh, with the highest degree in an S&E field, who were women, rose from 31% to 37%. Uh, 
Between 1993 and 2010, the share of women in SME occupations also rose, not as much, but from 23% to 28%. Women are concentrated roughly in the same fields where they have concentrations in uh, degrees. So in life sciences, they are disproportionately represented relative to men, so uh, this is 48%, and less represented in the ones where they don't have as many degrees, and this is 25% in computer and mathematical sciences, and 13% in engineering. Roughly 70% of the workers in the innovation economy are non-Hispanic whites. And this is approximately similar to their representation in the overall uh, workforce uh, of people 21 and over, and that's 68%. So data from the firms that exist, the private firms that exist in the innovation economy are terribly hard, hard to come by. Uh, so due to uh, a Freedom of Information Act request, journalists were able to get information on uh, three firms uh, who voluntarily provided these data uh, from Dell, Intel, and Ingram uh, Micro. And what we see for, uh, for whites is that they are represented 64% uh, in the innovation uh, uh, economy represented by these three firms and 68% uh, in the workforce. Um, Asians, 20% in these firms, 5% um, in the overall workforce, Hispanics, 9% and 15%, and for African Americans, 6% and 11%. With respect to invention, there is a bit of divergence with respect to incomes. Um, they differ by gender and race. So if we're looking at uh, men's and women's salaries, they differ quite uh, significantly. In 2010, this was $80,000 for men, the median salary, and the median salary for women was $53,000. This is the highest degree in an SE field. This is full time work, and the gap is smaller if you consider SE occupations, but it's still 19%. There's a 19% difference. The gap is smaller when you consider. Um, whites and um, blacks median salaries. It was $72,000 for whites and $56,000 for African Americans using the same uh, metric. So most of the work I've done has been on patents and I actually did this kind of calculation for uh, patents and there's a significant divergence with respect to participation. Uh, for women in African Americans. So we find significantly less patent activity for women in African Americans. If we compare uh, the number of patents per million uh, for the US, for US inventors, it's 235 per million. For women, it is 40 per million. And for African Americans, it's six per million. So very different outcomes there. But innovation, the development and sale of invention, is where the big divergence really is. This is where uh, wealth inequality uh, comes. This is an interest of economists since innovation is a source of wealth creation and higher living standards. So if we look at a very rudimentary measure, and that's the assignment of a patent to a firm, and these data we collect from uh, from patent records, we see that the odds of assigning a patent to a publicly traded company are 51% lower for women than for men. And for African Americans, it's 46% lower uh, relative to US inventors. So as Richard was saying, commercialization and entrepreneurship are where the large monetary gains are. So um, a recent example of that is Google's purchase of the Motorola patents, of the 17,000 Motorola patents for $5.5 billion. Uh, when I've talked to VCs in my research, one of the serious uh, criteria for consideration is having a patent pending. And that's because patents are becoming increasingly the strongest form of intellectual property protection. 
So what do we know about startups, those who are uh, attempting to commercialize invention? Only three to five percent of them are headed by uh, women. Uh, women and African Americans are nearly absent from management teams and boards apart from legal and marketing divisions. And you've probably been following the conversation on Twitter about Twitter's board and the lack of a woman being on uh, Twitter's uh, board. African American entrepreneurs account for roughly 1% of, of startups receiving venture funding. In sum, these data raise fundamental questions of income inequality, uh, and the critical work has been done recently by uh, Saez and Piketty, and wealth inequality, uh, critical work that has been done most recently by uh, Piketty. So why do economists and uh, the public care uh, about this? Well, first of all, people evaluate their economic well-being relative to one another, not in absolute terms, but this could lead to uh, social unrest, and uh, this would not be a good long term because it could also lead to social unrest, of course, could lead to lower rates of economic growth. Also, top earners in the economy can increasingly influence the political process. So you saw from the recent McCutcheon uh, Supreme Court decision, and some would argue the Citizens United decision, the Supreme Court decision, that um, wealthier uh, people, top earners, have increasingly more influence in the political process. So with respect to recommendations, um, I am a macroeconomist, and I, I just don't really have any yet. I'm still doing the research, so I'm looking to hear uh, more from the panel, but it's worth considering. How do we affect output, or rather input and outcomes? How do we affect demand and supply so that there is participation, greater participation at each stage of the innovative process? Should there be more education on lost opportunities? So one of the most striking things that I found in my preliminary analysis of patent data is that single sex patent teams were much less productive than integrated co-ed uh, teams. So my argument would be, why would there be arbitrage opportunities that are not being exploited? So maybe there needs to be more education uh, about this and the success rate of firms. Should we increase the pools of uh, people who are participating, uh, African Americans, uh, women? Should there be more coaching and more uh, pitching? Is that a way to do it? Should there be more engineering uh, programs that integrate women at a more uh, consistent level? So there's been a lot of research on this, and engineering programs seem to be uh, and engineering firms seem to be particularly bad at uh, attracting and retaining uh, female talent. The Snyder, Governor Snyder of uh, Michigan has proposed that more, uh, specifically 50,000 visas be granted to the city of Detroit so there can be a drop of innovative, high value talent into Detroit to, uh, to completely reform it and its uh, economic activity. Well, well, we'll see if that happens, but I don't think that can be a solution by itself. So with that, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Rob. Hello again. I. Uh, I'm sorry to announce that Dick Nelson last night contacted me and was, will not be able to uh, present today, uh, but I had gone through his paper and I will try to inject into our conversation stream uh, a synopsis of what Dick wrote. And you will be able, through our website, to get the paper yourself. Uh, it's a bit daunting to try to do justice to Dick Nelson in the realm of uh, innovation and technology. He's, one of the real founding fathers of the discipline. Uh, he wrote a paper where he starts by contrasting neoclassical economics with dynamic innovation systems. And he was very uh, adamant 
that the, the equilibrium neoclassical system did not illuminate many questions that he thought were important. And he emphasized in particular that innovation always entails a great deal of learning, learning by doing, a process on the fly. He asked two fundamental questions in his paper. One was, is growth good for society? when it's inspired by technical innovation. And he said we should examine this in the context of what happens to living standards for large numbers of people and what happens to employment, employment security. The second question he asked, which is more, which you might call macro question, was does capitalism need innovation in order to survive? Here he's speaking about whether we have persistent deficiencies of aggregate demand if you're not continuously spurred by investment demand. And he said if investment demand diminished to a very small proportion of total demand, could the society continue to evolve or would we enter into a slump? Uh, he emphasized very, very clearly in the paper that innovation is not just spurred by profit motives. He thought there were many dimensions of motivation and required a deeper organizational and institutional and psychological investigation, and he did not think that behavioral economics had yet addressed that frontier. Uh, he talked about the role of patents and how there was very different behavior in different sectors. And he cited in particular the lack of importance of patents in the development of automotive technology. Uh, he said that the strongest statement I found in his paper was when he said that it is an illusion to believe that we can create policies that support aggregate levels of innovation. He saw this as a case-by-case -case basis, and his final normative recommendation was to say, you have to define as a society what you need and then see what works in the particular sector what kind of incentives, what kind of things uh, as which might call tools of public policy can be brought to bear. But he did not see a one-size-fit-all uh, approach to innovation. He did not see a universal logic of the economics of innovation. Sometimes I do myself harm when I create titles for panels that I subsequently have to be on. So I'm going to dispense with this title very quickly. Is innovation always a good thing? No. Is innovation always a bad thing? No. I, uh, I apologize for the title that I created months ago. Uh, the question I want to look at today, and this is from this vantage point of being INET, where I've, I see innovation in technical process, innovation in governance or organizational design, but our realm is the innovation of ideas. And I'll change the title for a moment and say, has innovation always been viewed as a good thing? And when you study the history of ideas and creative ideas, you see very clearly and Rene Girard at Stanford wrote an excellent paper on this called Innovation and Repetition, that innovation was despised socially for many years. It was considered an attempt to become a god, to alter God's order in a way that was blasphemous. And people were punished for trying to be innovators in many different realms of life. When people like the scholar Ray Raymond Williams have, in his book, The Long Revolution, have studied the nature and the evolution of what constitutes intellectual innovation, he says very early on, the only type of innovation that was revered was imitation. An artist or a creator who could render a picture of a natural setting that was considered which you might call illuminating and flattering to God's order, was supported. Aristotle injected the notion that innovation in ideas could go further. Instead of just imitation, imagination and envisioning 
what could be a better world. And he felt that the poets were unleashed with this spiritual purpose. Plato didn't quite like some of those notions. Plato thought that there were what you might call vulnerabilities of the emotion in the heart that one could appeal to. You heard my earlier comments about propaganda and manipulation, and Plato felt that everything had to be scientific, evidence-based. You couldn't trust the narratives of the poets. They would take you off course. They were a siren song of temptation. And then, as society changed, 1700s, 1800s, beyond, more and more resistance to an order, an order that considered the church and the state to be oppressors rather than legitimate authorities, led to what you might call a, a breaking away, a secularization, and an increasing appreciation of innovation, a fostering of innovation that uh, you could say innovation became a disruptive element where people began to have faith that it would improve material living standards, it would free people from political servitude. The creator at this time was considered to be a person in a triangle where the norms of society were in one place, the creator who not only had to envision his experience, but also envision how to communicate to society. And then through that communication of innovation, he, sought to, he or she sought to evolve the norms of society. And this was a very contentious activity. It was a contentious activity particularly as the Thirty Years' War approached. And many people with innovative ideas lost their lives. And in some respects, the Enlightenment retreat to abstract universal rules that seemed to have an antiseptic quality was an attempt to find a common language that would calm the tensions and calm the emotions of people who were unsettled by these innovations. In this city, until very recently when he passed away, was one of the really great scholars on the history of innovation and ideas. His name was David Noble. I had the good fortune of taking a course from him when he was on the faculty at MIT when I was an undergraduate. He was written some famous books, America by Design, Forces of Production, Progress Without People, and his last couple of big books were The Religion of Technology and Beyond the Promised Land. And David said that if humanity could get on top of, could get involved in the process and, and convince people that in innovation in the modern era is not tantamount to salvation or deliverance or transcendence or redemption, but is a human process that if we exercised human agency, that, how would I say, if we didn't have uh, unbridled faith that we could make great use of innovation and great use of technology but he was filled with all kinds of warnings about the attractions to religious analogies and the way in which people substitute faith for scientific evidence. In many ways, that tension between Plato's view of needing evidence and Aristotle's view that the inspiration and the poets and the faith could show you the way forward has now been turned on its head. We're now at a time where innovation, I mean, people, people for 100 years or more are referred to as ludites, as though anything you do as a human to stop innovation is a bad thing and you should be pushed out of the way. And the idea now, at some level, 
that we need scientific evidence about the social consequences of innovation to which you might call challenge the narrative that innovation is always and everywhere a good thing is perhaps a part of the mission of INET going forward. As I mentioned in my earlier comments today, what concerns me in this dilemma is that one can imagine very self-righteous knowers, what I'll call the hubris of knowers, who pretend that they can foresee all of the consequences of innovation. I do, uh, would not accuse him of that, but Bob Gordon wrote a paper that was very influential in the last year or so that I thought was extremely audacious because it pretended it could determine there would be no unintended beneficial consequences of the recent rounds of innovation. And I think that is, uh, how would I say, his crystal ball is a heck of a lot better than mine. But I also believe in this human agency that the kind of perspective that's derived from historical study and was distilled in an article written by our own Bill Janeway about the need for a mission, the idea of defining a mission that has healthy human and social dimensions and objectives and putting our ingenuity and our scientific institutions and our minds to task in service to that mission is the best way I know of believing that innovation will be a good thing. Thank you. Uh, well, Rob, thank you very much indeed. Um, so, so I'm based in Silicon Valley. If we were having this conversation there and we flashed up that question, I think it would be a very short conversation because everybody would say yes and we'd move on. Because, you know, when you're in Silicon Valley these days, you see that the, the, the world is beating its path to California, Northern California, trying to work out how to discover the secret source because the growth, the, the world needs growth. Uh, there's a general belief that innovation is the answer. And so um, I suppose, you know, my question is, why are we having this discussion? Why are we posing the question this way? And so maybe I can frame it this way. Is there some, so Lisa, you know, from your discussion, what I heard was innovation is great, but it's simply how the results are shared out. But is there anything in the nature of innovation itself that we're in the midst of, either the nature or the pace of innovation that presents particular problems and issues that we're only just beginning to deal with. And so maybe I can just start with that, you know, the, the, the nature of innovation, this kind of phase of innovation we're in, and the pace of change that just seems to be accelerating. Is something going on that makes this, this different? Should we think about this period differently? I don't know, Jim, do you want to start? Oh, okay. Um, well, yeah. I'll throw it open. The, 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 uh, the, um, there's no question that the pace has picked up. I, I think that's irrefutable, and it's got lots of consequences, which Lisa um, brilliantly pointed out. And so uh, I think we all agree that it, it's, it's, it's a reality. It's like debating, you know, is it good the sun rises in the east? Uh, uh, I'm going to say yes, because it does, and it will. So, so the question is, how do we grapple with it and make it our friend, not something that is not our friend? And, and I think you know, as Lionel Robbins said in economics, there's nothing in economics that relieves us of the obligation to choose, so we, we must choose the system we want and we must have the system uh, uh, manifest the world that we want to live in, and that goes to elements of system design and research and dialogue and the tremendous kind of things we, we have here. So um, innovation is happening, it's accelerating, it's powerful, um, if properly harnessed, it's an enormous force for good, and it's, it's the responsibility of brilliant people and engaged protagonists to make sure that that happens, and uh, legacy systems do a certain job at a certain time, but when facts change, uh, I think it's, it's an imperative to update them, and, and that's really the mission of this conference. 
No. Please, sir. So, so I think we've created a lot of jobs for philosophers, right? So I think that there is something good and possibly something potentially bad in a lot of innovations that we've seen recently. For example, 3D printing. This could revolutionize, let's say, access to medical devices for people in the developing world, um, in rural areas, for example. On the other hand, we can, we can build guns with 3D printing, guns that actually work. And anybody could have access to them, including um, you know, small children. They could be uh, used in a willy-nilly way. Um, if you saw the movie Her, um, artificial intelligence, so you know, this guy is dating his OS system. Now, as a single person, I found that actually attractive because the OS system sent out a book manuscript when uh, the protagonist was reluctant to send it out. So, so, so this uh, OS system was reading his mind about what he actually wanted to do. Seems like a really good thing to me. But of course, you know, this has its limits. Uh, again, I think uh, there's a role for uh, philosophers here. Driverless cars. I can see as uh, a person who was in a car accident and uh, was not mobile, was disabled for a short period of time, this could revolutionize the ability for disabled people to participate, or elderly people, to participate in the economy. So this is, is, is a great thing. This can be a great thing. But it could also pose challenges for liability, for responsibility, and, and so on in our economy. So I see a, a dual uh, for every single innovation we, we see. I don't think there's anything that's uniformly good. I don't think there's anything uniformly bad. But I think I see a lot of jobs. As an economist and a former philosopher, I see a lot of jobs for philosophers out there. As a, as a journalist, I spend my life receiving pitches from companies developing new technologies. And I've started to get pitches from gun companies who, you know, with, with guns that you can shoot. A pitch I just received, a gun that as you fall, you can shoot and still hit a moving target at 500 yards. Oh, wow. So you know, these, are the, these are the things that are starting to be commercialized very quickly. But, but what you're saying, Lisa, then, is that it's, so it's not just the pace, it's the nature of some of these technological changes that are now upon us. And we haven't quite seen the effects yet, but the techno like, technologies like 3D printing are just on the edge of becoming a reality, can have a huge effect. Rob, what do you think? Well, I, I've had a number of times in my life when what I was doing was very profitable. And I really wanted to believe I was doing good and well at the same time. I just don't know if I had proper perspective. So I'm not surprised that in Silicon Valley you have very short conversations. This is some of the disruptive discomfort that is the basis of INET holding a conference like this is designed to challenge, not to accuse, but to challenge those notions. I don't think uh, without consciousness and mindfulness of the consequences of an innovation. And I put my asterisk on there. In a world of radical uncertainty, it's pretty hard to get your arms around that. But without making that attempt, the question is, what are you really trying to create? In many cases, I work with a young man who's a genius in the pharmaceutical world, makes orphan drugs. He's really motivated and passionate about helping people with critical diseases. And he's had a couple of successes in his life. And it, it, it's a passion within him that is tremendous. But he is a very soulful guy. He tries to be very mindful. He's actually talked to the FDA about something he could have gotten approved to take it down when he understood there was an adverse effect. Uh, we're not always that mindful. And I think critical discourse is what foments mindfulness. Well, so, um, I mean, when you think about the pace, the pace of these things, the pace at which things are happening, the um, you know, economic history tends to kind of teach that you know, society adjusts, the economy adjusts. Uh, if, if secretaries and telephonists are no longer needed, well, you know, now we have app developers and whatever else. You know, Apple claims 600,000 people now 
work in the app economy. And seven years ago, or even six years ago, I think, you know, before the iPhone, uh, if someone had told you that, you'd have said, what is the app economy? So, um, I, is, so is, it the, is it the pace of adjustment we're talking about here? Is this the biggest social issue that, that we need to address? Or is there something fundamental changing in the nature of you know, the changes that are taking place? Um, it's just a pace thing. Lisa. So I, yeah. I, I would say that I am encouraged by the pace of innovation and the adoption of technology. And again, I'm, I'm typically thinking about the developing world. So um, while we have a very hard time getting literacy uh, increasing literacy among people in the developing world. There's so many mobile phones out there now. We can do, we can teach literacy and we can do literacy tests on mobile devices and we haven't been able to do this in human history. We're able to touch people who haven't been touched before by something we've taken for granted in the uh, developed economy. In uh, Kenya, um, uh, M-Pesa is the number one way in which, uh, and this is a, a way of moving money between mobile devices on your mobile phone, and um, it is now much larger than the formal banking system. So th th this has completely circumvented the traditional banking system and is like the central bank. It's larger than the central bank, larger than the transactions of the central bank. So I think that adoption we've seen in places where we probably wouldn't have guessed that there would be adoption, and it's brought radical change to those places, integrating those people into a world that had never been connected to them in any meaningful way ever before. So I'm encouraged uh, by this, and I think this is also happening in, in rural uh, areas in the United States, for example, but I think there's so much uh, potential there. I'm, I'm not necessarily afraid of the pace of uh, adoption. Uh, Rob. I, I think the pace is related to the question of the governance of the process, the social ramifications, and uh, whether you think it's doing good or bad. I would say if the velocity of reducing the carbon footprint to zero was greatly accelerated, we'd all give it a standing ovation. I think when the velocity of changes to the structure of employment are not accompanied by support for retraining and reallocation of human beings so they get caught in a corner, they lose their livelihood, the velocity of those kind of changes are quite daunting. Some people might tolerate because it doesn't affect them, those heavily affected might be quite anxious. And to use a kind of Rawlsian philosophical notion, <clears throat> when ex ante, none of us knows which of us is gonna fall through that trap door we might be a little bit more interested in a social insurance that would uh, uh, mitigate those costs. Jim, any thoughts on that one? Um, can I segue to the dematerialization yeah. side of that uh, a little bit? Because you, you, you opened that door. Yeah. Um, and, and so this short term versus long term, and it's within a, a set of complex demands. And so um, I'll just pick up on that change of dematerialization because um, it, it, I chair our, our Sustainable Technologies Fund in Canada for the government and served on the UN High Panel for uh, Sustainability and, um, and, I, and we really got active in reforming economics to feed the system we want and that this is an opportunity and, 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 I, and, and Dr. Hahn um, um, uh, was on the panel. He, he, he chaired the OECD Green Growth Report and and, uh, and that, but if you look at that report, I mean, who are the largest holders of IPR in green technologies? It's China, Japan, or sorry, Japan, Korea, and the United States. So um, I, I think we, we have to see this as, um, uh, you know, as a structural issue. Uh, I think a lot of people look at these things as fiscal and uh, monetary. I, I think that, you know, we have some structural opportunities here that don't cost money. Um, but their system designed so that, that in fact, you know, moving the economy with materials uh, in, compels uh, a codependency of innovation to attenuate that, that footprint. And in fact, they need each other, need each, need, need each other 
globally, but they need each other domestically because the process of fixing it can't make one country rich and another poor, especially if the poor country just makes them poorer. And, and so it goes to um, structural elements of, of you know, how do we, how do we share and, and value this, this, this stuff and, and uh, price it? And, and because it's not a natural uh, right, it's a, it's a negotiated right uh, for, for a societal benefit. It's, it's, you don't have physical possession and, and there's no multilateral sense of it yet. Uh, it just gets driven from primary economies. So they're almost the reserve judicial system, like a reserve currency, and then it propagates uh, globally, but it has no uh, responsibility beyond its borders for the, the manifestations of that. Uh, so I think as we innovate on this, um, I think we need to think a little broader than our traditional instruments. I, I think we're seeing rapid change. Uh, I think we need um, different kinds of change, short term and long term. It, it's a reality. And, and I think we have to seriously update our, our systems as we approach that, and not the least of which is for the equity side and how do you price it, not the least of which it is natural capital. And, and, and I think there are answers there and I think we've got to chew on them, but we're strangely blind in the public discourse of this right now. And, and I think we've got to feed that with research and thinking and narratives that will become convention maybe three, four, five years from now, which we kind of urgently need. Well, let, well, let's come back to some of the, the remedies in a moment. I, I just want to go just a bit further on jobs for a moment because um, we're in a slow recovery that's been slow for a long time. Employment levels haven't picked up much. There's a debate about the extent to which that is due to technology or other effects. Um, but it also that now there is a debate about the extent to which we're on the brink of much greater technological change caused by automation both robotics, which are finally becoming a reality, and artificial intelligence, um, and the analytics that are changing knowledge work quite broadly. And to go back to the trapdoor question, I think a lot of people, I think rightly, are worried now about both how their jobs will change and whether they'll even have a job. Are these fears valid, um, and, and how worried should people be he wants to start. Lisa, I saw you nodding, Lisa. <laughs> we should be worried. Uh, <laughs> we should definitely be worried. But I think that the, the question is how we should be worried. So my students ask me this question all the time. And all I can say is that they should be prepared to solve the world's problems and better, better prepared to do so. So we've learned recently that uh, your salary is pretty much determined by the highest math course you ever took. So it's an easy way for me to encourage my students to take more math, right? So, so it's not that math is, is going to be one thing that is uh, always uh, needed, but you need to be able to solve some of the problems using the tools that we are, are, are garnering. So, so that's typically the kind of question I, I get. Um, I think Rob is absolutely right. We don't know who's going to fall through that trap door. But I think that we have some empirical evidence. The, the most popular course this year at Harvard is the introductory computer science course. So I, I think that it's not, uh, I, I think this is, it, it's not a distant notion. It's not abstract that one should try to get ahead of the curve. I mean, one, you know, one question that seems to follow, though, is whether this is just an adjustment or whether even there will be jobs for all those computer scientists and yeah. math geniuses in yeah. future. Yeah. Yeah. And whether, in fact, what we're seeing is such a, uh, you know, a disparity now in a separation between high income and low income work that right. you know, but, this so, is a, becoming a permanent and long term right. change, in other words. But we have that question about the entire economy. So it's not just technology and its introduction 
into the economy, its adoption during the, uh, the crisis. We don't know how the economy was damaged from the 2000, 2000, 2007, 2009 episode. We fundamentally don't know how the economy has changed. So this is just one more aspect of it. And, and certainly, this is open to debate. This is uh, Jorgensen. This is Sickle. This is the work of a number of economists who are trying to figure this out. They're trying to figure out the 1995 to 2000 episode. They're trying to figure out the uh, post-2000 episode. So we're hard at work trying to figure it out. But I'm, I'm just suggesting that putting this on top of the 2000, 2009 episode just uh, makes it even more difficult to disentangle. Right. One, um, uh, one result of um, technology and one impact on employment, and, and Lisa, you touched on it already, is um, that um, it, is, you know, it, it creates entire new opportunities you wouldn't imagine. You talked about mobile and mobile payments, for instance. So. Um, uh, the, the unbundling, if you like, of big companies and the fact that work can now be done by free agents, by, I, I think we call it the sharing economy, is this year's buzzword, but uh, I'm sure it'll be called something else next year. Um, you know, I, I, one very striking example I came across quite recently, and maybe will be close to the hearts of some of the people in this audience, was a startup that is using um, freelance people in the emerging world to collect economic data so rather than send high-paid economists overseas to collect information, analyze it, and process these big you know, kind of formal indices of what's happening in economies, you can, thanks to smartphones, and this is all about smartphones, uh, you can give someone in Africa a smartphone, pay their, and all you need to do is pay their monthly bill, uh, in return for which they will go to their local market and photograph the prices on all the pro produce. And that is a real-time source of, and this is their company's building businesses out of this, that hedge funds will pay a lot for that. That is more valuable real-time data than you're ever going to get out of a more formal system. So, you know, this incredible innovation, it's creating all this work at very low wages for people internationally and taking away high value or high paid, not high value, high paid work in other areas. I mean, is that just the world we're in now? Are we all going to have to get used to that? Boy, that's... Uh, you started the smartphone thing. It's your fault. Yeah, well, guilty as charged. But the, um, I, I think Rohinton had something interesting to say about the, the institutions and, and are they, you know, what do we have wrong and, and are these institutions doing the job um, we want to do? Um, and so I, I really think this is about imagining the, the system that we want and make sure the system gives for us what we're, what, what, what we're looking to, to find. Uh, we have this tremendous um, sense of opportunities and possibilities before us, and, and I think um, it's very exciting, and there's, there's enormous promise, and I'm hopeful for it. Uh, we just need to make sure that uh, we give imagination a front row seat uh, in, in the way we approach and, and think these things and, and make sure that, that all these institutions uh, deliver us um, what they're supposed to deliver and that we're not just forced into some kind of, we're not in some kind of forced march. No. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, it, you look at that and you say, wow, that's transformative. And you look at all the people that are ec economists collecting data and they're out of a job, but it, how do you think the accountants and the bookkeepers felt and, and what does the world look like after that? And, and I, I think, we're not slaves to this unless we make ourselves slaves. Can I, can I say something as a person, an economist who collects data in these places? Um, so I did my dissertation on, on Russia, and I lived there in the 90s, and I did it on banking in the 90s. Um, I shouldn't have been there. It was an extremely dangerous place to be. So an assumption in what you're saying is that we want to be there. We don't necessarily <laughs> want to be in these places. We want to make sure that there is comparative advantage. So this is allowing the people who have greater access to markets to take pictures of these prices. It, you know, it would be distorted if I were to go into a market and take uh, prices. And I did that sometimes in, in Rwanda. But I'm just saying that 
I don't see the loss here. In general equilibrium terms, somebody's getting a job that needs it. Somebody in, in some part of Africa is, is taking pictures of prices and, and absolutely needs it. This isn't something I should have been doing in the first place. Okay, yeah. we'll give that one up. What about, what about, well, let's move on to wealth inequality because, again, you know, many factors at work, but one thing that's coming out of the digital realm is incredible wealth an incredible wealth disparity. Um, I think I saw some figures that, you know, the Bay Area in San Francisco now has, you know, just about the biggest wealth disparity. And I suppose you only need one Mark Zuckerberg or two and you, that's where you're gonna end up. But uh, is this an inevitability of, um, you know, the, the new world we're in? Or again, is it, is it something we can somehow modify? I or, think uh, I'll cite one of the people who will be a speaker at this conference, uh, Wang Hui from uh, Tsinghua University, who believes that we have a global crisis of representation now because as wealth, in, in part because as wealth becomes highly concentrated, we can create an adverse feedback loop where the wealthy change the policies to their own benefit. Globalization involved a realignment of America's comparative advantage. And what was done was to use the money to cut, to lobby, the, the, the gainers use their money to lobby to cut their taxes and deregulate labor. And it exacerbated the inequality. There are very significant quantitative studies of that. You had mentioned uh, this outsourcing of various service-like activities. Alan Blinder, has written a series of papers at Princeton University where he thinks the, the most daunting challenges of reallocation are still in front of us as more and more what were non-traded goods become traded goods. Wang Hui's notion of the, of the crisis of representation is a question of how are we going to create collective response that values humanity? How are, in any given nation or across nations, will uh, will we be able to address these challenges? Jim, you, you've had first-hand knowledge of digital wealth creation. Tell us about it. Is it something different? Oh, it's pre it's, it's pretty good when it works for you. <laughs> um, so I, I, that's a candid truth. Um, but yeah, I, I think I, I think we'll. I don't see how this level of inequity and. I mean, I was privy to some stats yesterday that companies are becoming unbelievable at outsourcing and temporary agencies are soaring in, in what they do. Um, and, and IP acquisition is up and to the right. And, and so you have real dramatic changes in how business is done at its most basic level in the US economy in terms of capital, IP, labor, like equipment, labor, and IP, it's fundamentally shifting. And, and if you look at the, the charts, it, they're, they're, I mean, I could get them, they're, they, they shock you at, at their graphicness. So the structural way of interplay has shifted. And, and you know, where does this go? Um, and and, 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 and it, if you are the one on the trap door side, I, I, or in the, in the forced march, I, I would think that's that's not a good place to be. And it says to me that they're gonna shift politics strongly to the left. It may be too strong if people don't like it if, if we don't start to get proper representation in, in the system where everybody has a really good stake in the system. So if you're saying inequity is going up really strong, I, I don't think that's a good social capital structure. Absence of morality. I don't think it's, it's smart social design just for a good society that's gonna be safe and, and, and all of that. So I, I think we're, we're changing, we're playing with shifts that if you look at the charts, they've really accelerated in the last decade, that the shifts of these structural elements have really shifted. So we have a, a different set of circumstances now than we did 10 and 20 years ago. We have to make sure that our thinking and our economic systems and our institutions and, and how we inform our approaches within the, the nation state and between nations, now that they're all connected, make sure that we, we, we work well with these technical and structural realities. 
Let's, um, let's open this up to some questions. I, well, I want to get on to some of the remedies here, but let's all the responses. Let's, um, let's see. If you have a question, um, wave, and there should be some microphones going around. I can see one here and two at the back and one here. So there's a microphone there and there's one at the front. If we can bring it down here. And I'm going to ask... Uh, I'm going to ask our panelists to keep this nice and short, and we're going to see how many questions we can pack in. And I'm going to ask for the questions to be short, too, and if you could uh, announce two, who two you are. Two points. One about the automation is the question of what happens to labor. We, we've seen a hollowing out of the middle class in the United States with outsourcing. Now, suppose you have robotics. Uh, I call the attention to a movie by Woody Allen called Sleepers, where everything was done by robots. The question is income. It's very nice to have everything, uh, labor-saving devices, but where do you give the income to people so that they can buy these labor-saving devices? And secondly, I think that mathematical uh, example you gave is really blaming the victims for their problems. What you're saying is if you don't take math, you're going to be destroyed by the new technology. After all, we do have differences in talent, and there are some people who math is not going to be talented. What you're saying is those people nice deserve sure. to be on the bottom of the list. I don't think that's a very good policy. Thank you very much. Where's the income going to come from? People don't have the jobs. So some economists have suggested that people need a guaranteed minimum income. You have to pay everybody some kind of income because there won't be jobs in future. Is that, is that where we're going? Or is there another? I think it's a very daunting challenge when our entire social system has been based on participation in the labor force as the value of your life, how you contribute to the society through your work efforts and you're compensated therefore, to now decouple those things. But if fewer and few people own all of the means that create material and service well-being, we will have to decouple the two in order to stabilize and maintain a society. Any, anybody else got a solution? Lisa? So, so I'll, I'll, I'll just say that I'm, I'm not suggesting that every um, student, and I don't tell my students this, that everybody should become an engineer. The fact of the matter is that math is becoming a greater and greater part of our living. If you think about um, Nate Silver's uh, 538 blog, for example. Um, you couldn't have imagined 10 years ago somebody publishing confidence intervals and people being interested in them and dissecting them and trying to figure them out. It's just becoming a greater and greater part of our, our, our lives and our ability to solve uh, problems. So this isn't that everyone should become an engineer, but increasingly, um, as we saw from the s and &E engineering statistics, uh, economy statistics that I was showing, this part of the labor force is growing. These jobs are growing. So this is just an attempt to show what might be useful uh, for those uh, jobs in the innovation economy. All right, let's take a question then. If you could say who you are. Hi, Eilish Campbell. Question for Jim. I just want to unpack uh, something around IP. It's a question I've been struggling with. Should, we, should our IP systems have more gradations, um, depending on what's being patented? Thinking of different sectors, life sciences, manufacturing. Do we need to get into uh, forced licensing? I just want to challenge you to kind of take us a little bit further down some of your thinking, um, both as someone who's benefited and is now looking at these systems uh, from a new perspective with SDTC. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, well, I, I kind of half lived in, in the Beltway lobbying for patent reform for two or three years and know all the judicial guys very well and testified uh, with the commissioner of the patent office on, on patent reform. So I'm, I'm deeply, uh, it was a big part of my life for a long time. Uh, and the principle of the patent reform was they wanted one instrument. They didn't want multiple instruments. And I, I think that was a big mistake because the structure of IT is dramatically different than the life sciences. So you could be in a lab for 10 years and spend a billion dollars and find this one combination that changes something horrific to, re, to address it. And, and in fact, that one claim is, is worth that. But then you take um, an IT system like this, and it's literally got a million claims reading on it. So I, I think 
there was a deficit in imagination of imagining the, um, the, uh, the design of the patent system. I think it's, it's ethnocentric, um, which is the job of domestic legislatures when, they're, when it's a domestic economic agenda, um, at least in the short term. Um, I, I think there's, there's a very dramatic patent case before um, the, the U.S. Supreme Court right now on, um, on software patents, uh, and, and, and I think there's complex issues on extraterritorialness of patents. I was involved in kind of the poster child patent case uh, about a decade ago uh, that got, you know, was very interesting, and it had extraterritorial designs on it. So, you know, this is a very foundational aspect of every aspect of the D, of the IT, of the, of the uh, intangible system we work with. It, it defines everything in a way that you just don't realize because it's pre-structured. It's, it's very technical uh, and, and it requires sophistication to even see it, that it's there. So my response to that is that I think unpacking this issue deeply within our economic systems structurally as they relate to natural capital management, social capital management, spurring new growth, it, it is this tremendously critical cog that it just has to be right at the center of, of, of this kind of file. So I ha I'm not surprised you're struggling with it. Uh, it is a tricky, complex thing. Uh, I saw a question right through the middle here, and then we'll take one here. Well, I'm Giovanni Dosi. I'll try in 30 seconds to try to address the question of the session. Uh, I think we should distinguish first uh, financial innovation from technological innovation. Financial innovation by and large is bad, is a weapon of mass destruction, and is a weapon of uh, uh, differential appropriation of rent, by and large. Uh, if technological innovation uh, tends to be good with the two important caveats that we have got always, we have got, we have got a, <coughs> this Schumpeterian expression, creative destruction. Always our emphasis has been on the creative and we have got, a, and we had a lot of de-emphasized the destruction. Basically the destruction is in terms of uh, jobs, uh, and in terms of environment, because uh, uh, contemporary technological paradigms are not very sensitive to environmental externalities. Final point, uh, the balance between uh, uh, job creation and job destruction associated with technical change varies in the long term. And I think that uh, this, is, this should be one of the major issues that we want to address. How uh, did, which was relates this, also to the this, investigation of the man patterns. Is this going to be a question? Sorry, do you have a question? No, it's just, a, it's just a comment, and I finished. All right, thank, thank you. Um, and uh, this, I think, is uh, the way it destroys jobs, and it, it, the way it creates demand, I think, is a big question right. mark uh, that uh, is part of the new economic thinking. All right, thank you very much. Uh, if we can keep into questions, it would be really Absolutely, good. I'll keep it short. Um, so my question is regarding free-flowing human capital. Uh, what are all of your opinions on the necessity of this uh, free-flowing human capital in order to spur innovation? Do you think that we in the Western world possess the capable mindset uh, to, uh, to create this? And are we missing out on the potential from uh, human capital uh, in, in you know, East Asia and Africa? Because the problems that they faced are drastically different than the problems that we face. Well, I, I don't think that um, we, I, I don't think their problems are drastically different from ours in the sense of the example that we were just discussing. Because if, some of, the, some of the solutions to their problems can be addressed by the technology that we're making for ourselves. So you've seen mobile phone adoption that is dramatically different from classic telephone adoption, fixed line telephone adoption, right, um, for various reasons. And this is revolutionizing the lives of many people in the developing world. So I don't think that our, our preferences are unaligned. 
Um, but when you have all of these people taking pictures of uh, prices, for example, at very low wages, those, lo those wages are eventually going to rise, right? I mean, this is, they're becoming a part of the world economy. And I see it all as a part of the integration of uh, the world economy. Now, while there's a job being taken away here, uh, or, or, or let's, say, let's say for the sake of simplicity being taken away here, there's another one being created at another level back here in the US. I, I'm freed up to do the research that I was supposed to be doing because of that technology. So I, I think that they uh, can be complementary. We just have two Let's take a question over here. Hi, Park Marzellis. Um, so you mostly talked about innovation on the private company level, and that usually leads to patents, and that leads to tempor temporary monopolies. And what do you think about innovation uh, from the government or from government-funded research centers, especially in areas like medicine and pharmaceuticals? Because uh, they w could then be um, opened up to society or to um, medical facilities where they can actually save lives and not have temporary monopolies on uh, misery, basically. Well, I, I, I think that's an excellent question, and I think you're going to get a lot of, you're going to have a killer session with Mariana Mazzucata and uh, Bill Janeway talking about the role of the, the state and, and the entrepreneurial state and the innovative role and the mission orientedness of that, because there has been a myth that, you know, it's a private enterprise that does this stuff, but in fact, I, I think a lot of these things actually came from government investments over decades, and then and then the economy manifests very well these types of things into new enterprises if you have the right design systems in place. And uh, Marianne and Bill would argue that's why Silicon Valley became so successful and was all the NIH and, 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 uh, and, and military um, spending for decades and then people smartly, and they made sure there was loose IPR and there was supportive government programs and, financing small businesses and all of that and then bang, and good capital markets and then bang, you look at what Silicon Valley is today and everybody's trying to replicate it for good reason. It's a, it's a powerful engine that, that works. Well, the, yeah, the, the military, yeah, the internet, <laughs> yeah, GPS. Well, uh, let's yeah. take a question. In that the context, yeah. uh, I see a number of Silicon Valley firms doing more and more work in Asia where government laboratories are supporting the basic research that is the seed corn to their commercial development. Uh, and uh, th there's been a lot of frustration with American diminution of uh, basic science spending. It's a myth that, that there's a thing called a free market that everything just flows freely and comes from it when there's been enormous uh, engagement at the state level in very, very constructive ways for decades, and, 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 and that was a design, and it, it worked. And so it, 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 and the internet or new drugs or, or, or many, silicon, uh, the, Intel and, and, and TI were forced to be created in licensing protocols by the military if IBM wanted to stay in the game of supplying them and be funded. So it, it just shows that you have to design and design the system you want and envision the outcomes you want and 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 and, and they knocked it out of the park in the valley, and I think we have to think about that now. We're going to take, well, take one more, one more question, then we're going to have to wrap up. John Chisholm. Uh, interesting that in this uh, $19 billion acquisition of WhatsApp by Facebook, Facebook, Facebook got not one single new patent. So whatever value they saw in the acquisition was something other than intellectual property. Which brings me to my question. Uh, is there an escalation happening a positive feedback loop between market regulation and intellectual property. Uh, we see patents more valuable and essential in pharmaceuticals where products take years to get through clinical trials uh, than in IT where industries and markets are relatively less regulated. If so, might this positive feedback be helping concentrate wealth as we see relatively few larger players in pharmaceuticals who welcome the regulatory barriers as compared to many more players in IT. Can I, sir? Lisa. Uh, so, um, so just to, to, to be clear, um, while the WhatsApp 
a transaction may not have included a patent, it doesn't mean it didn't include any protected intellectual property. There are many forms, and especially because it's software, typically, traditionally, more appropriate would be copyright. So I, I wouldn't say that it's not in the picture, and there, I'm sure, are legal claims that can be uh, laid, uh, uh, could be well-defined with respect to intellectual property rights. But I think that for your broader question, I think we already see what you're saying, that there are already these major players that have uh, very large, not just in pharmaceuticals, that have um, very large uh, legal teams that are really ready to define a patent broadly so that it could be uh, defended easily and to uh, protect themselves from existing, uh, with existing patents uh, from infringement. So maybe Jim can speak to that more than, than I, but I think the system that you're talking about already exists in, in many sectors, not just in pharmaceuticals. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I caught part of it, John, and I look forward to having more of a chat with you on this. I mean, they, they're an excellent company that came along, but they were, they were in a, um, a bidding process between IPR hegemons at the time, so they represented a community that fit within that. So, um, and uh, uh, Facebook had, has been rapidly buying, spending billions on patents and did a big deal with IBM, and, and the DOJ is deeply involved in the system design of competitiveness of these acquisitions. Uh, I was part of the Rockstar Consortium with Apple that Microsoft that bought the Nortel patents, and there was key in, you know, designs, and then, then that facilitated the Moto Google thing, and then Facebook had to buy that. So yes, you had a startup, and it became a real good augmenter to entrenched systems, so it's not all that. I'm not trying to say it's all that, and I hope I'm, I'm not, but I figured I'd pick a role of provocation on this panel today, but I hope I'm not seen as the guy that thinks the whole game is just that, that tool. I, I just think it's, I'm trying to get it really at the front row uh, of this, and, and I, I couldn't quite get the life sciences part, so I'm sorry, I can't respond to that. I just didn't hear it. And incidentally, I would add that uh, we're now talking about the $17 billion Facebook acquisition because <laughs> Facebook stocks come down 20, 25%. So I'm sure there'll be, we haven't talked about bubbles and busts, but I'm sure there'll be lots more in the next yep. couple of days. So thank you very much for uh, an extremely interesting kind of tour of uh, a very broad horizon. I think these are all issues that uh, will be dealt with at much greater length. I hope these speakers will be around if you want to come and grab them afterwards. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for moderating. Excellent job. Thank you. Well done. Thank you to our panelists for beginning the discussion today and to Richard for ably uh, moderating. Uh, we're about to uh, take a coffee break, but just before we do, I wanted to share the uh, sad news that Canada's former finance minister, Jim Flaherty, uh, died today at age 64. He's somebody who helped steer Canada through the rough waters after the 2008 financial crisis and had important ideas about innovations and in governance, including in securities markets and helping to change liquidity uh, uh, regulations in the mortgage market. Uh, so we remember Jim Flaherty, and uh, it's certainly another uh, important uh, reminder at this conference today that we are all human after all. 15-minute uh, coffee break. <laughs> <laughs>